Today, let us share the Word of God under the title about the soul. Shouldn't we correctly understand about the soul so that we can have a living hope for heaven in our life of faith? 2,000 years ago, in the time of Jesus, the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. They had no understanding of the soul. The same is true of the people in this age. Today, 7.7 billion people are living in a small village called Earth. Among the 7.7 billion people, there are people who are living with an understanding of the heavenly principles and people who are living with no understanding of them. There are many different types of people on this earth. So one of the teachings that Jesus gave when he came to this earth 2,000 years ago was, you are blessed for you can see, hear, feel, and understand all the words of God. If we cannot accept nor understand God's words, no matter how much God explains to us, it is very frustrating, isn't it? There is a reason God made this earth. And there is a reason we've come to this earth and are living here. The earth wouldn't have been created if there were no reason or purpose. And we wouldn't have come down to this earth to live if there was no purpose. When you look carefully, there is a reason it had to happen this way. Our physical life on this earth is an extension of the things of the spiritual world. And in the future, we will be completely forgiven of all our transgressions and sins that we committed in heaven. And the glorious way for us to go back to our eternal heavenly home will be opened by the sacrifice of father and mother, won't it? 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to the earth and explained all spiritual things. But the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and many people who were obsessed with Judaism did not understand them. Since they only viewed Jesus' physical surroundings with their physical eyes, Jesus didn't look like God who was prophesied in the Bible and who created the heavens and the earth and everything in them. That is why sometimes they tried to stone Jesus to death and raised an objection to what Jesus said. At this, Jesus said, not everyone can see God's words of life. Not everyone can hear them or feel them. However, blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear and your hearts because they understand. Jesus gave these words of blessing to his children who were living their lives of faith, knowing God's will correctly. It is written in the New Testament, isn't it? Today, let us take some time to study about the soul, which God taught his children through the Bible. Can we see souls? If anyone can see souls, he or she must be very frightened every night. Generally, souls are invisible to our eyes. Since they are invisible, most people don't understand, although we tell them that we have souls. It's because they cannot feel them. People think they are able to move around and function because they eat and store energy in their bodies. However, if there is no soul inside, can the body function? No matter how much food the body eats, it cannot function. Can it think? It cannot think either. Can it see? No because it has become a senseless being. What enables us to feel, see, 
and understand everything is our souls. Aren't you able to see, hear, and feel? Back in the 1960s and the 1970s, many Korean soldiers were deployed to other countries. And also, many people went overseas to work. Since the Korean economy was extremely bad back then, people went to the Middle East to earn money. They supported their families because they were paid much more than in Korea. One father went to the Middle East. In the Middle East, mainly in Saudi Arabia, there was a lot of construction work. From there, he sent a letter to his family. Here, the temperature goes up to 50 degrees Celsius in the day. If you break an egg and put it on the car hood, it fries. When his family heard this, they couldn't believe it. Why? Because they'd never seen anything like that. Because they'd never experienced the temperature of 50 degrees Celsius. However, now even in Korea, we experience the temperature reaching almost 40 degrees Celsius due to climate change, right? As we've experienced this, we can now believe that the temperature can go that high. But back in the 1960s and the 70s, it was very rare. But it is common in the Middle East. And the letter read, also, here, some people just abandoned their cars on the side of the road. Back then, Koreans couldn't believe that people would abandon their cars. And when they even heard that people had to pay to throw away their cars, it was beyond their understanding. But what about now? Once in a while, we hear on the news about people who abandon their cars in the remote countryside, don't we? Back then, families with cars were very rare. If they could get even a junk car, they would use it after fixing it up. Now, cars have become a necessity for life. Statistics say there are 20 million or 25 million cars in Korea. Each household has one or two cars. However, back in the 1960s or the 1970s, Korean economy was so bad that people could not own a car. That was why it was hard to believe that people in some countries abandoned their cars. It was also hard to believe that an egg would fry if you break it on top of a car hood. Why? It was because they hadn't experienced or seen it before. Most people have the same idea when it comes to the topic of the soul. They think, I've never seen a soul, nor have I felt it. So, does it really exist? When it comes to the spiritual world and the soul, God came to this physical world from the spiritual world and taught us what this spiritual world is like. And He explained to us about the spiritual world and the heavenly world through letters called the 66 books of the Bible, right? Right now, we haven't experienced that world, but that world definitely exists. All the children of Zion should believe this and go to that world following God's guidance. Today, let us open Genesis chapter 2 together and take a look at the passage when God put the soul in human beings after creating them. Chapter 2 verse 7 reads, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. God created the human body from the dust of the ground, and he breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. This breath of life is the soul. When a man dies, what happens to the body, the dust, and to the soul, God's breath of life in us? We call it death when the two are separated from each other. 
This is also God's teaching in the Bible. Let's confirm it. Let's see Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. The dust returns to the ground it came from. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 explains what happens after a man dies. The dust returns to the ground it came from, and the Spirit, which is the breath of God that God breathed into us, returns to whom? Returns to God who gave it. When our spirit and body are combined, we move around as living people. But what happens to the spirit and the body when we die? They go back to where they were originally. This is called death in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Then, let us study about the spirit that returns to God, that is, the soul. Let's see 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 17. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Here, we can see how God, through Elijah, saved the son of a widow. When God saved him, what does the Bible say? It says that as his soul returned to him, he lived. What about when his soul left him? He died, right? When God created the heavens and the earth and everything in them, God made the human body out of the dust and human soul with the breath of life. Isn't that why human beings are moving around now? However, when a man's body and soul are separated, we say he died. When a man dies, to whom will his soul go? The soul goes to God. And what is going to happen there? What will he receive according to Hebrews chapter 9? He will receive God's final judgment for his life on this earth. It is written, God will see if you have lived a life deserving the glorious kingdom of heaven or a life deserving hell where you will suffer forever and ever. God will repay you according to what you've done. Let's take a quick look at this. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Just as man is destined to die once, and after that to face, what? Face judgment about whether he is righteous or wicked. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a what time? A second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. He comes a second time to save poor souls who are destined to go to everlasting hell. We must follow God who has allowed us to hear His voice. It is written that God is going to come to this earth to lead us to the everlasting kingdom of heaven, isn't it? 
We definitely have souls, and there is a spiritual world. When Jesus came 2,000 years ago, he said, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of God who can destroy both soul and body. Didn't he teach like this? Let's see Matthew chapter 10, verse 27. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Here too, Jesus clearly mentions about our souls and reminds us that there is a spiritual world. Isn't there something called learning in this world? The type of learning in the world is learning how to adapt ourselves to the world and live well in this world. Then what about God's Word? God is teaching us how to adapt ourselves to the heavenly country. We are learning how our souls can become accustomed to heaven. Earthly things are so momentary, instant, and temporary. I hope we will look at the eternal things in heaven and not lose our hope for the eternal world. Let's move to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and study a little more about the soul. Chapter 15, verse 50. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood, that is our physical body, right, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be, one, all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable. It means we will be resurrected, doesn't it? The dead will be raised imperishable. And what is going to happen to us who are still alive? It says that we will be changed. And we will be changed. Verse 53. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Let's continue with verse 55. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Here, God tells us that we will be changed into spiritual beings and go to the glorious spiritual world. He is explaining about our future through the Bible. The eternal kingdom of heaven, where we will go soon, is different from this world. In this world, sorrow, distress, and pain overflow. However, in heaven, joy and happiness overflow, and they are created anew every day. God will give this world to all the children of Zion. In the three-dimensional world, we think, can such a world really exist? Usually, people do not believe the things that they've never experienced before. They believe things that they've experienced and that lie within the range of what they know. But they don't try to believe things out of the range of their experience. However, does the heavenly world exist or not? It definitely exists. A man once said to me, I would believe the existence of the soul or heaven if I can see them. How can I believe things that I cannot see? So I asked him, 
Can you see America from here right now? I can't. Then it doesn't exist since you cannot see it. You cannot believe its existence, right? Everyone, doesn't America still exist even though you cannot see it? People who've been there say, America is like this, it is like that, don't they? If a person says, I saw a sign that read, buy this car for $100, people do not believe it, thinking, there's no country where that's possible. Back in the 1960s and 70s, cars were expensive in Korea. They are still expensive. But back then, it was impossible for people to imagine they could drive a car because of the economic conditions. So people couldn't understand why people would throw cars away. But what about now? We can understand why. In the same way, just because it is a world that we have not felt or experienced, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Since God came from that world, He explained everything to us about that world. In order for us to come correctly to God in the spiritual world, it is written in Revelation chapter 22 that God will repay us according to what we have done on this earth. Isn't it written, God will judge according to what we have done? We must go toward the direction God is pleased with. Let us live for the life in the kingdom of heaven, where we will go in the future instead of only thinking of our life on this earth. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 15. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left to the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will do what? Rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. We will live in heaven with God forever. There, joy and happiness will overflow, and everything will be created anew day by day. This is a world that is likely to appear in a fairy tale. People imagine and dream about this world. That world actually exists. It surely exists. However, since men cannot feel that world fully, God Himself came and made it known to us so that we can feel it, didn't He? You all remember the story about the dragonfly larvae, don't you? Some dragonfly larvae were living in a pond. Then a frog came from outside of the pond and said to them, There are flowers, and the sun is out in the day, and the moon at night. And there are beautiful changes in the cycles of nature throughout four seasons. The dragonfly larvae couldn't believe what the frog was telling them about the world outside of the pond because it was something they had never experienced. But since the frog was telling them so realistically, they didn't know if they should believe it or not. So they held a meeting and made a conclusion. Whoever becomes an adult dragonfly will go outside of the water. Then he shall confirm the world out there and come back into the water and let us know about it so we can believe that world exists. However, none of the dragonflies who went outside of the water ever came back. They cannot return once they went out into different dimensional world. Can a dragonfly come back into the pond and live in the water? Just as it did when it was a larva? A change was made in them that they couldn't live like that anymore. Therefore, in the larvae world, they wrote in the dictionary, the frog is a liar. This is why Jesus felt bad. I'm telling you what I have seen. 
I am explaining to you what I have heard. I am telling you what I know. Nevertheless, why don't you believe me? It is just like the letter the Father sent who was working in the Middle East, which reads, it's 50 degrees Celsius here. And if you break an egg on top of a car hood, it fries fast. It was something that Koreans had never experienced before. What if the letter wasn't from the father, but a friend of theirs? Or someone they didn't trust as much as they trusted their father? They would say he's exaggerating too much. However, those things were true. Although these things are all real, people who haven't experienced them don't want to believe them. That's why Jesus said, Blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear, and your hearts because they understand. Everybody, today, let's think about the spiritual world which God has awakened us to once again. We cannot go to the spiritual world with our physical bodies. Dragonfly larvae spend their entire life in the water. So, their bodies are optimized to breathe, eat, and do everything else in the water. However, once they become adults, they have a streamlined body with transparent wings and a long tail. Once that happens, they cannot live under the water anymore. There has been a change. That was why they gathered and discussed and made a conclusion that what the frog said was a lie. It wasn't a lie. When they become adults and come out of the water, they will see flowers, the sun, the moon, and beautiful trees. They will smell the scents of flowers of all different types and colors. Then they will know that the frog told the truth. Just because it is a world that we cannot see with our eyes, we shouldn't think that that world doesn't exist. We, the children of Zion, should accept that world with eyes of faith. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it is written, Meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. God tells us to walk the path of faith thinking of this glory, doesn't He? God gave us all these teachings through the Bible. Shall we also see 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14? But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God's breath and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible is Father and Mother's letter. God has given it to us, all mankind. What should we do with Father's letter? We must believe it and have conviction. Through whom was the Bible written? God Himself wrote it. It was written by the prophets who were moved by God. Let's see 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from whom? From God, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Since they spoke from God and wrote what God gave them, whose will are all the words of the Bible? They are all God's will and God's love that is delivered to us. 
God wants to restore us, the heavenly children who sinned and were cast down to this earth, back to our original spiritual state. All the children of Zion must engrave the teachings of the spiritual world on our hearts once again. Isn't it written, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived the glorious world that God has prepared for us? Anything that is considered the best on this earth cannot even be compared with what is in heaven. Let us engrave on our hearts the will of God, who prepared that beautiful and glorious world for us, and who said, In my Father's house are many rooms. I will come back and take you to be with me, so that you also may be where I am. We must never be like the people in the world who think we don't have souls. We must make effort to view things the way God views them. By doing so, we will go to the spiritual world where God dwells. A long time ago, in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 30, Solomon said, I lived with God, being filled with delight day after day. Let us be the true children of Zion who can enjoy eternal life and blessings forever in the glorious kingdom of heaven, where there is no more death or mourning or pain, but only where joy and delight is. As written in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, asking you to be the sons and daughters of God who can do so, I'd like to conclude today's word. Thank you very much.